Thank you. And the final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion 7373 in the name of Elaine Smith on thyroid patients deserve fair treatment. This debate will be put without any question uh, being put. I would ask any member who wishes to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Elaine Smith to open the debate. Thank you, President Officer, and thanks to the members who signed my motion, allowing me to bring this important issue to the Chamber as my first members debate this session. And as far as I'm aware, it's also the first time thyroid issues have exclusively been debated. And that's surprising, since hypothyroidism affects 2% of the population, and as 95% of sufferers are female, it's also a big issue of women's health. However, that maybe explains why not enough attention has been paid to it, either by politicians or by the medical establishment, both of which, as we know, are male-dominated. Claire Puller, who wrote to me recently, summed it up well when she said, this is a male-dominated profession actively silencing a female-dominated patient group. Perhaps if 95% of thyroid sufferers were male, causing them to become economically inactive, then diagnosis and treatment might be dealt with very differently. There are, of course, some men with thyroid problems, but it is undoubtedly a medical scandal affecting thousands of women, and the lack of appropriate diagnosis and treatment is a matter of gender discrimination. <coughs> but women are now fighting back in ever-increasing numbers, despite being ill. They're becoming experts in the field of endocrinology, and the current threat of withdrawal of lyothyronine, or T3 as I'll refer to it now, has driven them even more. The Improved Thyroid Treatment Campaign has also motivated people to become involved in demanding appropriate treatment. And campaigners have also been motivated by the fact that so many women, mothers, sisters, daughters and constituents of MSPs, are suffering unnecessarily, being wrongly diagnosed, living half-lives, dying of heart failure, myxedema coma or committing suicide. There are some patients uh, in the gallery tonight and others are watching the live BBC feed. So I do hope that the Minister will seriously address the issues raised and not stick to a script perhaps prepared by civil servants based on information from the intransigent male-dominated medical establishment. President officer, the thyroid gland controls total health and well-being and it has been described as the body's engine. In the 70s, the standard course of treatment for hypothyroidism changed from natural desiccated thyroid or DTH to levothyroxine or T4, as I'll now refer to it. This is a synthetic hormone which is inactive and it requires the body to convert it to T3, which is the active form that's needed to function. Presiding officer, it's difficult to get a thyroid diagnosis in the first place, as many of the symptoms mimic other conditions like depression, the menopause and even Alzheimer's. And many women are told they're borderline and they're not given any treatment despite displaying hypothyroid sy symptoms. And untreated, they're likely to be costing the NHS in other ways, for example, infertility treatment, antidepressants and obesity, because some of the problems associated with thyroid disorder include depression, insomnia, infertility, anxiety, hair loss, weight gain, breathing problems and extreme fatigue. And I have personally experienced all of those as I have an underactive thyroid. I was originally on T4, but I would not be standing here as an MSP if I had not challenged a misdiagnosis when I became symptomatic again a few years ago. I was finally put on T3, and this brought me back from the dead, quite literally. And my full story is available on the Petitions Committee website if anyone wants to look at it. When I started helping Lorraine Cleaver's petition in 2012, I thought I was doing it for others because my situation seemed to be resolved. Over five years later, and along with many other women, I'm facing withdrawal of my life-saving T3 simply because of cost, not because I don't need it. Unbelievably, we're now going backwards in diagnosis and treatment. We're not moving forward with the up-to-date research that's readily available. Presiding officer, it's officially admitted that 5 to 10% of patients on the usual treatment of T4 do not do well, and many are unable to convert it. Since the medical establishment will no longer allow the use of DTH in the UK, the only alternative course of NHS treatment for those patients is T3. This is an entirely different medicine to T4. The human body has got to convert T4 into T3, and we know that some patients just can't do that. Therefore, to suggest that patients on T3 can be safely moved to T4 is appalling, and it shows a complete lack of understanding of thyroid function. Eminent Scottish endocrinologist Dr Anthony Toft has recently said that he suspects in time we'll be going back to using DTH, which some patients are currently buying privately from abroad. But in the meantime, 
All we have is T3. It's a terrifying prospect that for many women, this life-saving medicine is no longer being prescribed on the instruction of health boards aided and abetted by NHS Scotland. Most patients can't afford to buy it privately and they shouldn't have to, but the alternative is unthinkable. The British Thyroid Association recognised that the main reason for the withdrawal is not medical, but is the astronomical cost charged by the company, who until recently were the only producer of T3 in the UK. In Germany, 100 tablets cost £25, in Norway, 15 in Turkey, £1.25. Concordia charged the NHS an unbelievable £922, a point helpfully highlighted yesterday by the BBC. That is a near 6,000% increase over the last few years. Why can't it be sourced from abroad? But it must be resolved by tackling the price and not by attacking patients. Turning to NHS Lanarkshire, which I mentioned in my motion, their new clinical guidance on hypothyroidism has been written by two diabetes experts and a GP. It's full of wrong information, out-of-date research, including an irrelevant paper on overactive thyroid issues. They've admitted the errors when I've challenged them, but now it must be recalled from all of the GPs that it was sent to. And then they must ask thyroid experts, preferably those who know about T3 and who know the difference between hypo and hyperthyroidism, to rewrite it. Frankly, it's shocking that this could be produced in the first place. I also got wind last year that the board might be issuing instructions to GPs not to prescribe T3 and to remove it from patients currently on it. They denied it. And it was only after lodging FOIs that I discovered there had been such correspondence, including an email um, saying that T3 is an expensive medicine and telling a GP practice they'd have to bear the cost themselves if they prescribed it. There's no doubt that the underlying message to GPs is to stop prescribing T3, and that is outrageous. But it's working because many women are now telling me that they've been taken off it and they'll probably be coming to all of their MSPs to tell them the same thing. GPs have got a duty to prescribe the drugs their patients need and they should be guided by the principle of do no harm. The BTA's 2015 statement has been misinterpreted by medics and because of that they have recently had to clarify their position as follows. The BTA position statement on hypothyroidism should not be interpreted as a recommendation to not use lyothyronine or as an endorsement for its discontinuation. That's pretty unambiguous. And they go on to say that patients on it should continue and that new patients can be treated with T3. Let's be clear, there are numerous rigorous scientific studies showing that T3 is a safe and effective medication. There are hundreds of Scottish women on T3, including me, who have been saved from a slow, lingering death, and there are hundreds more who could be saved. And let's remind ourselves, the medical establishment admit that up to 10% can't function on T4. Therefore, in Scotland, that means that they admit that well over 1,000 women can't function on T4. So what is the choice for them if they take their T3 away? Without thyroid hormones, patients die. And taking away T3 will undoubtedly result in patient death. So will the minister put a stop to the removal of T3 and send a clear message that GPs must prescribe it? I'm going to finish, presiding officer, with the words of Morag Webster, who wrote to me, and she wrote bravely about her own situation, and she said at the end of her letter, they've taken my 20s, my career, my friends, but I'm a better person for it. Imagine her saying that. I'm just disappointed they have robbed me of a chance to have a family of my own. This is a massive women's health scandal which must be urgently addressed. Thyroid patients deserve fair treatment. Thank you very much. We now call Angus Macdonald to be followed by Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, um, President Officer. Um, I hope uh, to be here for the full debate this evening. I'm, I'm actually hosting an event um, this evening, so apologies if I, if I do have to leave, but I do hope to be here. Um, so I'm pleased to, to be able to contribute to this member's debate this evening, not least because petition PE1463 by Sandra White, Marion Dyer and Lorraine Cleaver on effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment has been live with the Public Petitions Committee for nearly as long as the time that I've served on that committee, which is just over five years, uh, in which time we've taken large amounts of evidence on this subject. And can I take this opportunity before going into uh, any detail uh, to congratulate Aileen Smith for bringing this issue to the Chamber 
for debate uh, tonight and can I applaud her for the way in which she's championed this issue both within Parliament and by uh, also attending the PPC committee as well as raising the issue out with Parliament, uh, most notably with her own and other health boards. Sure. Smith. Thanks, President Officer. I thank the member for taking that intervention. Could we also maybe just clarify that the Petitions Committee are going to be bringing the issue to the Chamber so that there could be wider issues um, debated at that point? Angus MacDonald. Indeed, yes. Um, there's a draft report coming to the Committee uh, within the next few weeks, uh, and we look forward to discussing it further in the Chamber um, at a, hopefully a not too a distant date. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Elaine Smith for outlining in some detail this complex issue in her speech um, just now. Um, as I've said earlier, the Petitions C Committee has taken extensive evidence on this issue over the years, and more recently from Dr John Midgley, who believes there should be an, un an unbiased review of present protocols for treatment and diagnosis in the light of new evidence that shows that the single use of thyroid-stimulating horm hormone as a taste for as a test for thyroid deficiency and for treatment is unsuitable and misleading. Uh, Dr. Midgley has stated that the test for thyroid stimulating hormone is now overreaching, resulting in a significant number of patients, he believes, being wrong, wrongly diagnosed, wrongly treated, or not treated at all. Now, I have a constituent who has contacted me who is a thyroid patient and was diagnosed with autoimmune thyroiditis, Hashimoto's, at hypo, uh, and hypothyroidism in September 2016. She's taking T4 levox, uh, levothyroxine medication, which is a, a monotherapy drug that supplies the thyroid with an inactive hormone T4. As a patient who does not convert T4 into active hormone T3, the levothyroxine drug is, she states, next to useless for her. She's had to lobby hard for months with her GP practice and a Forth Valley Health Board in order for them to provide her with even one other thyroid medication option. Now, NDT, or natural desiccated thyroid, is controversial due to its animal content and unlicensed. Um, it, it doesn't have UK status. Uh, however, I understand a number of patients are uh, sourcing it abroad, whilst synthetic T3 is not entertained at all because of the cost. So as a result, my constituent has had to pay for a private endocrinologist to speak on her behalf with her GP and the health board before it was approved for her to even trial synthetic T3 as an alternative treatment. And she's understandably annoyed at the way she, she was forced to, as she calls it, uh, jump through hoops uh, to have her condition treated more effectively. As a result of her experience, my constituent feels that thyroid patients should not be limited to a singular medication option uh, that may not work for them. Uh, now, clearly, there, as Elaine Smith has mentioned, there's a, a cost issue. Uh, and I was shocked yesterday to, to see that Canadian drug, drugs giant Concordia, one of the producers of liothyronin, uh, has been hauled over the coals by the Competition and Markets Authority for overcharging for, for the product. It turns out that the NHS paid around £4.46 per pack in 2007, However, the cost has risen to £258.19 pence per pack by July this year, an increase of almost 6,000%. Now, the CMA Chief Executive, Andrea Costelli, said yesterday, and I quote, pharmaceutical companies which abuse their position and overcharge for drugs are forcing the NHS and the taxpayer to pay over the odds for important medical treatments. We allege that Concordia used its mar market dominance in the supply of uh, liothyronin tablets to do exactly that, end quote. Presiding officer, that's scandalous in anybody's book. Until earlier this year, Concordia, I believe, was the only supplier of the drug, but clearly any future competition will be welcomed by the 2% of the population that suffer from hypothyroidism, not to mention, not to mention the NHS. Can I? Yeah, briefly, Elaine Smith. Thanks. It's just a brief clarification, presiding officer, because as far as I understand, they've set the price at a similar price. Thanks, Donald. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the uh, clarification, presiding officer. In closing, um, I look forward to improved diagnosis, easier and cheaper access to drugs treating hypothyroidism, and also the easier availability in this country of natural desiccated thyroid, which is currently being sourced, as I said, uh, abroad by sufferers who are desperate to find any form of relief from the symptoms. So. 
Um, as uh, mentioned earlier, I also look forward to debating petition PE 1463 further at the future meetings of the, of the committee and hopefully seeing um, some uh, positive action in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by congratulating Elaine Smith on securing today's debate and acknowledge her passionate work on this important issue on behalf of her constituents with thyroid conditions and also for sharing her personal experience uh, this evening. I also pay tribute to those behind the 2012 petition to the Parliament's Petitions Committee for the work they've done in highlighting the serious concerns around the quality of care and treatment for hypothyroidism. And I commend the work of the British Thyroid Foundation, which provides advice and support to people with thyroid conditions throughout the United Kingdom. Hypothyroidism affects hundreds of people in every constituency in Scotland. And as the motion suggests, is a condition which will affect around 15 to 20 in every 1,000 women, but only one in 1,000 men. The risks of initial misdiagnosis can be significant as some of the common symptoms mirror symptoms for numerous other conditions. And early access to acute blood tests is therefore vital. Hypothyroidism is a serious condition, but if treated correctly, as Elaine Smith said, in the vast majority of cases, those with it can lead to normal life as long as their treatment is monitored appropriately. The original petition urged the Scottish Government to take action to ensure GPs are able to accurately diagnose thyroid and, adre and adrenal disorders and provide the most appropriate treatment. And I think all of us will be able to share that aim. And while some progress has been made since 2012, there's still much more that needs to be done. The lack of specific and formal Scottish guidelines on the diagnosis and management of the condition has been a key issue raised by many uh, patients ahead of this debate. While SIGN is not required to follow the lead of NICE in providing a full guideline on this subject, I understand the concerns that have been expressed and which focus on the specific needs of a significant minority of individuals who do not successfully convert T4 to T3. I hope SIGN will be prepared to engage with campaigners on this issue in a positive manner and look how we can make changes. I very much share the concerns that Elaine Smith has expressed with the guidance from some NHS boards which have implied that T3 should not be prescribed when, when this treatment or its use in combination therapy is essential to maintaining the health and well-being of patients who are not helped by T4. The decision to prescribe, prescribe T3 or indeed any non-standard treatment must be an informed clinical one made by a GP um, based on the individual circumstances and best interest of their patient. The work of the Competition and Markets Authority in relation to the costs to the NHS of the only T3 pro product available in this country is welcome and I look forward to the CMA's final uh, findings in due course. In preparing for tonight's debate, the big theme that emerged was the need for more research into a range of aspects relating to diagnos diagnosis and treatment of hypothyroidism. And as Elaine, C. Smith, Elaine Smith has said, my apologies, I would never uh, accuse someone of being Elaine C. Smith. The, the biochemical processes involved with thyroid function and the interaction between all the respective hormones are extremely complex and not yet fully understood. Again, there's a significant amount of concern that not enough research has been carried out into the specific group of people who do not respond to the standard T4 treatment, a subject on which there is little information known internationally. In addition, some people would like to see more research into the safety of the desiccated thyroid hormone, which has been used to treat hypothyroidism in previous decades, but is now unlicensed. And I would welcome an indication from the minister this evening as to how the Scottish Government is working with academia and pharmaceutical companies and to try to take forward new research into this area because I think it's over time that we saw this. Uh, to conclude, yes. Lane Smith. I thank the member very much for taking an intervention, presiding officer, and I would welcome new research into some of this, and particularly research looking at patient experience too. But also, if you look at the ITT campaign standard letter, there is a lot of current research that actually has, has changed its mind since previous research was done, saying that combination therapy works and that T3 is necessary for those who don't do well in T4. Um, I thank um, Elaine Smith for that. 
uh, intervention. I think what is important, and as she has um, passionately outlined, is that for patients across Scotland, they feel like their voice isn't being heard in this and that research and, and pathways to treatment aren't actually properly being considered. And I think this debate is very timely to actually make sure that we look towards how we can transform that treatment for so many people across this country. And so to conclude, Deputy Presiding, of, uh, Presiding Officer, um, I again welcome today's debate and very much welcome the focus which Elaine has allowed to be brought on what is uh, such an important health issue for so many thousands of people across Scotland. I hope this debate will help increase awareness and, and as we look to make more progress in both the diagnosis and treatment of thyroid conditions across Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Jackie Bailey to be followed by Rona Mackay. Um, presiding officer, clearly Mr Briggs is getting ready for the Christmas panto season, referring to Elaine C. Smith. I'm sure he won't mind if we refer to him as Rab C. Um, presiding officer, let me thank Elaine Smith, as others, others have done, for bringing this member's debate to the chamber today and for her um, very passionate speech on the issue. This debate is hugely important is long awaited for the many people who suffer with thyroid conditions. Some, as we've heard, who have been following the progress of the petition on this issue through the Public Petitions Committee since 2012. It is thought that almost three million people in the UK suffer from a thyroid problem. And as we've already heard from Elaine, about 95% are women. Hypothyroidism is a crippling illness and many people are being failed by poor and inappropriate diagnosis and poor treatment protocols. Indeed, some people are left completely undiagnosed and untreated. Currently, patients in the United Kingdom are waiting more than three times longer to receive treatment than their peers in the United States. In America, they're treated much earlier. We know that thyroid problems can progress slowly over time, which means that many people are left suffering a debilitating illness for many months or indeed even years before they receive treatment from the NHS. And the problems don't stop once the patient is eventually diagnosed. Current guidance that's been referred to already suggests that thyroxine T4 is the standard treatment for the majority of patients. That means that alternative treatments such as T3 and NDT are rarely offered. And that's despite the fact that there are many patients who do extremely well on T3, many more patients who require combination therapies. And one of the concerns for patients is absolutely the threat of T3 being removed from the prescribed medicines list due to the extortionate costs associated with the drug. As you've already heard from Elaine, but I think it bears repeating because it is just so shocking and stark, in the UK, 100 tablets of T3 costing up to £922. In Turkey, the same dose costs less than £1.25. In Greece, it's £3.24. The NHS is being ripped off by Concordia, the company which until earlier this year was the only supplier of T3. Just yesterday, the Competition and Markets Authority found that Concordia abused its dominant position to overcharge the NHS by hiking the price of T3 by nearly 6,000% in the last 10 years. That is a truly shocking position. And we need to remember that there is actually a very real human cost at the heart of this debate. Let me tell you about one of my own constituents. She's a hypothyroid sufferer. She's currently prescribed both T4 and T3 as a treatment for her condition. She's been prescribed the same treatment since 2005, despite tests showing that she has a genetic abnormality, which means that her body can't convert T4 to T3 as well as it should. Her doctor refuses to increase her dose of T3 and instead has twice doubled the do her dose of T4. There is no clinical reason for this. It is making her worse. And I've no doubt that this is because of the cost. I know there are patients, not just in my area, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but there are patients in Lanarkshire, patients in Tayside, where the health board has withdrawn T3 completely. What are these women to do? Have they to book flights to Turkey? That would actually probably be cheaper for them than having to access it through the NHS in Scotland. Now, I know that the pricing of medicines is reserved, but it shouldn't stop 
the Minister or indeed the Health Secretary from engaging in robust discussions with her UK counterparts because women across the UK need T3 to give them any kind of quality of life. The only reason, presiding officer, the drug is being withdrawn from patients is the cost. In closing, presiding officer, let me urge the minister to implement the recommendations from the Improve Thyroid Treatment Campaign Group. Ensure that T3 is not withdrawn from the prescribed medicines list and that doctors can continue to prescribe in the clinical interests of their patients. Ensure that the treatment protocols include T3 as a standard option and let's deliver better and more effective treatment for thyroid disease. Do you know, if this was happening to men, there would be a riot. So I urge the minister to make sure that women are not penalised and they receive the T3 that they need and deserve. Rona Mackay to be followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to thank Elaine Smith for bringing this important debate to the chamber and for her very personal and moving opening speech. It's very brave for any member to come to the chamber to talk about personal experiences and you can tell from her speech how much Elaine's life has been affected by this terrible condition. As a member of the Petitions Committee, um, as my colleague Angus MacDonald said, this petition has been running for five years and at times we've been at a loss to know how to make headway with it. Now, I don't profess to be a medical expert on the rights and wrongs of the drugs being used to treat this condition, but I do know that this is a condition which has blighted the lives of women because 95% of women are affected and have been for decades. Like so many, quotes, women's conditions, such as menstrual problems or the menopause, which of course is not an illness, but a normal part of women's lives, thyroid problems have in the past been dismissed by clinicians as, oh, it's just your age, or it's normal for a woman of your age. I've been on the receiving end of that advice, as I'm sure have most women. Thankfully, in 2017, these attitudes are changing, and the medical profession is taking a very different attitude to problems affecting affecting it, let's face it, more, ha more than half the population. We're at last starting to talk about them. But, presiding officer, I believe the core of the problem with hypothyroidism is that when it comes to diagnosis and treatment, the medical profession is to an extent stuck in the past with no clear pathway for diagnosis and treatment. What is clear that one size does not fit all when it comes to treatment. As we've heard, the effects of unmedicated or poorly medicated hypothyroidism are horrific. Fatigue, weight gain, depression, anxiety, stress, lack of concentration, dry cough, insomnia, and much more. Presiding officer, the bottom line is that the medical profession must listen to patient groups and individual patients. For example, when we, any of us are prescribed antibiotics and find that they're not working, we go back to the doctor to be prescribed a different type, usually with satisfactory results. If one drug doesn't work, then it's feasible to keep trying till one that does is found. And if that drug is T3, as Elaine has described, then that is what should be prescribed regardless of cost. We've heard today of the latest, the shocking controversy surrounding drugs companies and the drug liothranine or T3. This is a terribly serious issue. Patients should never be held to ransom by drugs companies and it's our duty, the Scottish Government and the UK Government's duty to ensure that they are not. Buying drugs off the internet is surely the last resort and patients should never have to go there. They end up risking their safety and it's costing them a fortune. For those who can afford to buy the drug, it transforms their quality of life. But what about those who can't afford it? Are they simply doomed to suffer? In Scotland, we pride ourselves entirely correctly that we have free prescriptions thanks to the Scottish Government. And no one should have to pay for good health. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I'd like to thank the women such as Elaine and, and the women in the gallery who have spoken out about this to help other women as much as themselves. They've highlighted a serious issue and I hope that we finally see the medical profession sitting up and taking action now before any more women are forced to suffer. Thank you. Bill Bowman to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. First of all, let me also thank Elaine Smith for bringing this debate forward. It gives us an opportunity to gain clarity about the treatments of thyroid patients and the challenges which they face, both of which are complicated issues. Many of these problems are highlighted in petition 1463, which has been under consideration since 2012, as I understand. And I also would like to acknowledge 
the work of Sandra White, Marion Dyer, and Lorraine Cleaver, that the, what they have put into the, that petition. As we've heard, in the UK, the condition affects 15 in every 1,000 women, 1.5%, one and 1 in 1,000 men, about 0.1%. In Scotland alone, the figure is roughly 100,000, so it is vital to ensure that they are receiving the proper treatment. For an underactive thyroid, this involves taking daily hormone replacement tablets, which should allow for a normal, healthy life. Unfortunately, lack of proper treatment can lead to complications. We have the expertise and tools here in Scotland to test for and treat thyroid illnesses, such as the state-of-the-art research facility at Ninewells Hospital in Dundee. Similarly, a Dundee business acts as shield as a leader in early diagnosis of critical illnesses and hormonal imbalances such as these. These facilities are a major boon not only for Dundee, but they're an even bigger boon in helping um, us improve lives here and elsewhere in the world. And we must nurture and support them wherever possible. Sadly, it appears there are a number of patients across Scotland suffering from thyroid disorders who are not receiving adequate treatment. The current T4 only treatment prescribed by the General Medical Council is inadequate for patients who are unable to convert T4 to T3, and we've heard about this earlier. T3 being the active form of the hormone. To put a figure on that, five to 10% of patients do not respond well to T4 according to the Royal College of Physicians. The current T4 only approach is at odds with the work of Dr. Toft, who's considered a global expert on endocrinology. Dr. Toft stresses the importance of allowing GPs to have the freedom to treat their patients according to their individual symptoms. Of course. Elaine Smith. Thanks, President Officer. I thank the member for taking an intervention. Dr. Toft also makes it very clear that GPs should look at their patients and not the blood tests because often the blood tests don't show up what the issues are and they certainly don't show if you're not converting T4. The blood tests will say that you're absolutely fine. But also, we don't even know what absolutely fine is because everybody will be different. And Dr Midgley suggests that some kind of test should be done, not just the, pin, the, the heel prick test that's done in babies about thyroid, but also some kind of test maybe in people's teens so that we would know what was normal for individuals. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you for that um, clarification. and enhancement of our, our knowledge. I feel a little bit like a student teacher here who's being observed from the back of the, uh, the classroom <laughs> getting corrected. But, uh, right. So, um, unfortunately, the, the Scottish Government's listening exercise and undertaken by Thyroid UK um, revealed that many patients who do not respond well to T4 have difficulty agreeing alternative options with their GP. Dr. Toft also makes the point that using blood tests alone as a basis for um, recommending treatment does not always reveal the full extent of a patient's needs. Basic thyroid testing needs to be improved to include options other than thyroid stimulating hormone test, TSH. These TSH tests measure how much of this hormone is in your blood. However, doctors can make incorrect diagnoses when using THS levels as an indicator. So good to say it twice. If we are to resolve this situation, both alternative testing and treatment options must be available for use. Fundamentally, this motion is concerned with the need for personalized treatment. We must trust in the expertise and experience of GPs to prescribe treatment suitable for individual patients. It is entirely wrong, the wrong approach to tie GPs' hands by only allowing T4 treatment. Therefore, it is worrying that the motion notes that some health boards are believed to be issuing controversial guidelines that imply GPs no longer prescribe T3. When patients are denied access to treatments, they sometimes experiment with unregulated, unlicensed products. Lorraine Cleaver from Thyroid Petition Scotland has said that patients, including herself, are spending huge sums of money on their health, either paying for private tests, seeing specialists, or buying medication not available on the NHS. This is something that should be of great concern to us all. So in conclusion, knowing that a simple change in treatment can mean the difference between a patient living with, a debil living with debilitating systems or leading a normal life it must be our aim that every patient receives the treatment they need. Let us hope we can trust the Scottish Government and our doctors to treat patients as individuals and, the, and treat these conditions properly. Thank you. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. And I didn't actually intend to speak in today's debate, um, so I might not need the whole four minutes. You'll be glad to hear. 
Um, there was two things that actually inspired me to um, contribute to today's debate. The first was uh, my colleague Elaine Smith's uh, contribution, which was very, very powerful. And as a fellow co bridger, I felt, uh, I felt inclined to contribute um, with what she was saying. And the second thing actually was that just before the debate started, I received an email uh, from a family member um, through an uh, in-law connection um, uh, just about this debate. Um, and that also inspired me to speak because she's actually emailed in uh, some of her story. Several years ago, she was um, diagnosed um, as requiring T3 and T4 treatment, uh, was on both for a while and removed for T3. And although she felt a dip in, in her symptoms after removal of T3, she was okay enough. But in June this year, they reduced her T4 medication from 300 milligrams down to 50, and she noted a dramatic reduction. But instead of getting the, you know, more uh, medication or back onto T3, just recently, she was actually taken off medication altogether. And she's currently off work, unwell, with a whole range of symptoms I don't need to go into that have been um, described by other people. And I know this personally, because obviously, as I've said, I know her. Um, and she puts that down to, to her treatment. So I, I do think there is an issue here that, that we need to look at. And I have every confidence in um, the Minister and the Scottish Government that, that, that we will do that. But also, and this is, this is a, an NHS board um, difficulty and, and with a particular case, but actually uh, the individual I'm talking about, when she went for treatment, um, her GP wasn't even aware that she had, the reason why she required treatment was she'd had her thyroid removed in the past. So I think there's a whole issue around there about what priority uh, thyroid treatment is given in Scotland and in the UK. And that's, I think, the point that Elaine Smith was making. Just a couple of points I noted down, presiding officer, the 2% thing came came around a lot. I, do, I don't know, I mean, I'm no expert on uh, thyroid disease, but uh, you know, I would suspect that that's 2% that are diagnosed. And uh, are we talking about an even bigger issue here? Um, but that would, I would imagine that's a, a worldwide a problem just when I've done a quick search uh, on my phone, as we now do, we can check Google right away. I noticed a connection between um, the mineral iodine and uh, there was actually an article come up that's saying that teenage girls in particular are at risk of iodine deficiency, which can perhaps lead to thyroid problems. Again, I don't know, but, but what I'm doing is, is picking up on what other members have said and saying we perhaps need more research in this area as well. Um, I do conclude that what others have said, that this is a gender-based issue, and I think we need to uh, hit on head. I don't think any is in the chamber here can deny that. I think if it was 95% uh, men that were getting this, we'd probably be looking at different treatment options. Um, and I'll probably just conclude by, by saying that, um, you know, we can take on the big corporations. We've shown it with minimum unit pricing. We took on uh, the big corporations there. We can do that for the, uh, the drug companies as well, and I hope that we can all work together to find a solution to this. And because I've done this at the last minute, I should uh, also declare, uh, as should I see you looking at me, uh, PLO to the Health Secretary. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. And I'd now like to call on Aileen Campbell uh, as Minister to wind up the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And like others this evening, I am happy and uh, privileged to take part in this debate. But before I start, I would, like others have, uh, want to commend Elaine Smith for bringing this debate forward uh, and recognise the passion and commitment that she has shown in raising awareness of this issue and bringing her own personal testimony uh, to the Parliament to outline the, the struggles that she and many other women ha have undergone through having this condition. Man many members have described the debilitating consequences uh, of the condition and the suffering that many women have to endure. And therefore, it's incumbent on us all to do what we can to support women and to help as best we can. And I'll also want to, like others have, welcome the women in the gallery this evening. Uh, but I know some of that might not be all that Elaine wants to hear, but I recognise, and I hope she recognises, that there will always be a commitment to work with her uh, as best we can to make the improvements that I think we all uh, seek. I also know that the petition on thyroid disorders is still being uh, considered by the Public Petitions Committee, and I, I sincerely look forward uh, to that report coming through, which should be uh, imminent. 
Uh, and the Scottish Government is supportive of those who continue to do vital work towards raising awareness for thyroid patients. And I'm, uh, again, encouraged to see so many people showing their support to the petition, to this debate, and, of course, the ongoing work that will happen as a result of the petitions uh, committee's work. Many members have mentioned guidance for clinicians as a concern. The British Thyroid Association position statement on the 25th of June in 2015 set out recommendations on the management of primary hypothyroidism based on a current literature review of the published positions of the European Thyroid Association and American Thyroid Association. This is the leading UK body for thyroid disorders and their guidance is endorsed by a number of expert bodies including the British Thyroid Foundation and the Royal College of Physicians. Further to this, in 2016, NICE published their Clinical Knowledge Summary of Hypothyroidism. This provides a concise, accessible summary of current evidence for prim primary care professionals and focuses on the most common and significant presentations in primary care. NICE also intends to develop a guideline on thyroid disease with an expected publication date on the 20th November 2019. Wide consultation across stakeholders, very importantly with patients and service users, will be uh, conducted. And I would encourage anyone with an interest in thyroid conditions to engage in the guideline development. And happy uh, to meet with uh, Elaine Smith uh, to uh, consider ways that we can enable women to ensure that they can take part in that uh, process. Lane Smith. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and thanks, Minister, for giving way. Lorraine Cleaver is actually involved in that process, but I wonder if um, you might commit to having a meeting with us just to talk about some of these issues following this debate. Minister. Yeah, ab absolutely, um, because we probably want to make sure that we reach out to ensure that as many women who are suffering in the way that many members tonight have described, that they get, if they feel that they've been disempowered in their uh, diagnosis, that if they get that opportunity to feed into this uh, developing uh, guideline that we enable that to happen and if that's something that Elaine, if she, Elaine wants to, to accompany uh, her to that meeting then absolutely we'll set that up. The Chief Medical Officer's report Realis Realising Realistic Medicine describes how we ensure that the people are firmly at the centre of the decisions about their health and care. It sets out how we help people make decisions about their care, making care focused on what people need and asking them what matters to you. And it's about giving people the treatment that is right for them at the right time with the right support. Certainly at odds with what we've heard, some of uh, the testimony tonight and certainly something that we want to ensure is embedded across all practice. John Lamond. Can I thank you very much for taking the intervention. You'll have heard tonight that people have been told that they can't ac access the medicine they require, they can't access T3, and the suggestion is this is because of cost. Would you be willing to write to health boards to confirm that they ought not to be excluding this as an option in the meantime while this process is going on? So, uh, thank you, uh, Joanne Lamont, for her contribution. I was going to come to some of that in response to the points that Jackie Bailey made in her contribution, because I think Jackie Bailey uh, outlined that uh, there was a concern about this being, uh, this being uh, concerns about this being removed from the prescribed medicines list. So, NHS England may be considering this, but there is no question of this approach being taken in uh, Scotland. Uh, in terms of treatment, the BTA position statement uh, I mentioned earlier um, takes into account... I, can I make a bit of progress? Because I, can get, I want to make sure that I get to the issues of T4 and T3 as well, if that's OK. And I've taken a couple of uh, interventions. If I have time, I will uh, come back to uh, Jackie. In terms of treatment, the BTA position statement I mentioned earlier takes into account uh, the... Uh, the wide-ranging international evidence base and concludes that T4 provides a safe and rational approach to the correction of hypothyroidism and that this improves the physical and psychological well-being of the vast majority of patients. In August 2017, the Effective Prescribing Programme looked at medication for a wide range of conditions, including best practice in the management of hypothyroidism. Uh, the EPP board concluded that there is currently insufficient clinical evidence of effectiveness to support the use of T3 either alone or in a combination as the first line option treatment of hypothyroidism. NHS boards were therefore asked to review the position of T3 in their formularies to ensure that T3 is only initiated on the advice of an endocrinologist given the potential for causing adverse side effects and to consider switching use of T3 to T4 at medication review. 
But this must be, and absolutely must be, carried out in a person-centred manner with full engagement and shared decision-making with the indi each individual. Face-to-face -face consultations are essential before any change is made, and there should also be an assurance that the change is for a trial period and that the individual can return to the original treatment if the mutually agreed outcomes are not achieved. achieved. It is recognised that a small proportion of patients do not tolerate T4. T3 use remains available as an option where the appropriate clinician is satisfied that this is the safest and most clinically effective treatment option for the individual. Smith. The Minister for taking an intervention, I know she's taken a lot, but actually people on T3 are on it because for, of medical reasons, if they're on it, on the NHS and to take them off it even for a short time is going to really have a detrimental effect on their health but also what the medical profession don't seem to be aware of is that patients who are not on T3 but on T4 only are then uh, putting themselves at risk or the medical establishment is putting them at risk of strokes of osteoporosis in later life of heart attacks etc so this is hugely dangerous and I was pleased that the minister said there was no question of it being taken off the T3 being taken off prescribed medication but I think we need to tell that to health boards and the women need to know that if they're on it or if their endocrinologists are putting them on it they are to stay on it and not to be taken off it. Minister. Um, and again you know I recognise the real um, passion with which uh, Elaine Smith makes her points and of course the clinician's duty primary duty is to do no harm and that's why we expect through the approaches outlined through realistic medicine through making sure that there is adequate and proper and meaningful engagement that those uh, circumstances which is outlined are and can be avoided and we make sure that there is a clinically effective treatment option for the individual who can tolerate T4. Um, members have mentioned also NDT which was used up until the 1980s and again there is a, a lack of robust clinical evidence that this has any clinical benefit to patients beyond that delivered by the recommendation, recommended medication T4. And I recognise the serious concerns raised here today as this treatment is currently not licensed for use in the UK and would urge anyone using that treatment or unhappy with their prescribed treatment to again talk with a healthcare practitioner responsible for their care. Other members also recognised uh, an issue around research and I recognise that there will be a minority again of people who cannot tolerate T4 and that further research on this is required. Uh, in Scotland, the Scottish Government's Chief Scientist Office uh, is responsible for funding high quality research projects. The CSO's research funding committees consider application from all areas of medicine. The only stipulation being that the research is led by a Scottish based clinician or scientist and that it has the potential to improve the health and well-being of the people of Scotland. The CSO does not initiate research but we welcome applications for research projects aimed at the management of hypo hypothyroidism that may include clinical trials for both P3 monotherapy and T3. T3, T4 combination therapy and we look to academic institutions to seek funding to lead on, on well-designed research to address these evidence gaps. The endocrinological uh, community in Scotland would also be happy to consider and assist with those proposals. Um, presiding officer, to draw my remarks to conclude, Conclusion, all decision making about an individual's health and care should be focused on the individual and discussed and agreed with them and their clinician. There are clearly areas which can be improved, especially when we consider the human cost involved and which have been so well articulated this evening. There is also much we need to do to ensure people's voices are heard and, and that they feel meaningfully uh, engaged with. So again, I would like to thank Elaine Smith again for bringing the debate to the Parliament, the members who have contributed and those in the gallery will continue to work together across health uh, and government and uh, across government across the health and social care services to make the differences that we all want to see but again I would reiterate that I would see opportunity in the nice work I can confirm that we'll continue to work with Elaine uh, Smith and others who want to be involved to ensure we can get meaningful uh, representations to that process and again look forward to the committee petitions work because I think there will be a further opportunity to reflect on the wider issue that people have expressed today about this being uh, somehow some, something that's not been taken forward adequately enough because of it being uh, more commonly felt within uh, women across the country. We don't want, I don't want that to be uh, the, the feeling that people have. This has been taken incredibly seriously. There are clearly areas that we can do more and must do more to ensure that people don't feel that they're being ignored, that they feel engaged and that they can make the progress in their health uh, so that they can contribute and not have that uh, uh, feeling that they are uh, somehow being uh, ignored or that their concerns aren't being taken seriously. So um, there are opportunities to make improvement and again I'll commit to working with Elaine Smith and others on that. 
Thank you. Can I thank the Minister and all the members for their contributions? And that concludes our debate, and I now close this meeting.